True crime, unsolved cases, strange disappearances. Join me as we travel through the timeline of some of the darkest acts in human history. Search and subscribe to The Deadly Countdown wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Kevin Eustace, and together we will look at some of the most unimaginable cases that have ever taken place. Search and subscribe to The Deadly Countdown, launching Friday the 27th of October. Start the clock. Live from Liverpool, The Dark Paranormal, Season 13. Hi everyone and welcome back to The Dark Paranormal, Season 13, Episode 3. First and foremost, a huge thank you to everyone who reached out following last week's episode, A Deadly Threat. By all accounts, and I guess that's the point of the show, last week's listener experience will stay in some people's minds for quite the time yet. I'd just like to say, I did receive an email from someone who asked the question, why I've stopped receiving listener experiences. Well, quite simply, I haven't. If you have a true paranormal experience that you believe would fit the dark paranormal, please email it over to contact at thedarkparanormal.com. That's exactly what today's submitter, Sean, has done. And via Sean's experience, today we're going to plunge into the dark world of something that we very rarely cover. That of the psychopomp. Now, that's a word that many of you may be familiar with, but for those who are not, it comes from the two Greek words, suka, meaning soul, and pompous, meaning conductor. Interestingly, according to the Oxford Language Dictionary, it can also refer to a spiritual guide of a living person's soul, and it uses the example a psychopomp figure who stays by her and walks in her dreams. In modern terminology, we've associated the word psychopomp with the Grim Reaper, that soul or spirit or entity that takes you at the time of death to your final resting place. However, who is to say a psychopomp is one individual spirit? And who is to say a psychopomp cannot have bad intent, be nefarious, malicious, and downright terrifying? But before we get to today's amazing experience, we need to, of course, thank our wonderful team over at Patreon. When you sign up to our Patreon, not only will you receive these episodes both ad-free and before everyone else... You can also gain exclusive access to our Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites. Dark Bites is a show which runs each and every Sunday of the year, even on the downtime between seasons. And there are well over 50 hours worth of true paranormal experiences just for our Patreons for you to go and binge. And of course, at the end of the show, we give you a shout-out to say thank you for subscribing to our Patreon. But the best thing about it is the community. We've built a wonderful community of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts over at Patreon. And we'd like to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. So if you'd enjoy early ad-free releases of both the standard show, the minisodes, debuts and finales, and of course that weekly Dark Bites episode, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal but right now please lower the lights make yourself comfortable and most importantly leave your disbelief at the door as we hear all about having the time of your 
death. I'd like to start by thanking you for giving people this platform to share their experiences. You've given people a chance that many don't get, and a place where they feel comfortable and safe to tell their truth. I've been listening to your podcast for a few weeks now, whilst I'm at work, and it makes my 11-hour workday go fast. But not only that, it's given me the courage to dig deep and write my experience for you. I don't know if my experience will make the podcast, but even not, I think it will help me cope with everything I've been through just by writing it out, and knowing that, at the very least, someone will believe me. My name is Sean, and I'm from a small town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I've believed in the paranormal for as long as I can remember. My mother has always told me stories about how I would interact with things she couldn't see. When I was five, my great-grandmother passed away. Two days later, I handed an old scarf that I distinctly remember smelling like lilac to my mum. Where did you get this? asked my mum. Old Nana gave it to me, I said. Well, I could tell she was freaked out. But she just gave a smile and went on with whatever she was doing. Another time, I was staying over at my mother's parents' house. When I was there, I would sleep on the couch. And that night, just before my grandparents were about to go upstairs to bed, I turned to my grandfather and said, Pop-Pop, your dad just wants me to tell you that he said hi. Well, he just looked at me and said, What? I then repeated what I'd just said. He then asked, When did he ask you this? Just now, I said, right before he went upstairs. Again, my grandfather looked at me with this puzzled look on his face. And then there were sounds of footsteps coming back down the stairs. We all turned and looked and saw the silhouette of who we could only imagine was his dad. This shadowy human outline walking down the stairs and then straight through the back door. I could go on and on about my experiences that I've had with spirits to this day. However, the reason I mention these experiences is to say I'm not new to paranormal experiences. But my reason for reaching out to you is down to something. I never thought I'd encounter. I've only had a few people believe me when I've told them this story, and I understand why. It's insane. It's insane to even try to rationalise. I was a camper at this camp for 13 years before I became a counsellor as I aged out. It's nestled in the mountains of Pennsylvania, a peaceful and loving place, and in truth, my second home. Everything was amazing there for years, until one year, when I made a huge mistake. The camp itself is around 60 years old, and before it became a church camp, it was an old farm. In my younger years as a camper, I never heard of anything weird or paranormal that went on there. Other than a few ghost stories, some counsellors would tell us about the farmhouse. Well, that was understandable, given that the thing is over a hundred years old, and therefore an easy scare for the campers. So I never thought of the place as creepy or scary just a fun-loving church camp. That's until 2016. I was a junior in high school at the time. 
when I had a couple of idiotic counsellors who decided to bring a Ouija board to the camp. They snuck out of their respective cabins once all of us campers were asleep and headed down to the barn, which now doubled as a wreck area and a mess hall and cafeteria. The top of the barn was like a labyrinth, which we used to walk through and pray on occasion. Along the left side wall when you first walk in are some old storage closets made of chicken wire, which we used to store old beds and some sports equipment such as footballs and basketballs. You know the type of stuff. General things you'd find in a gym class. When you first walked in the barn, there was a couch and a picnic table. It's only dimly lit by a few lights that were installed to allow for campers to play and hang out. And on the right side is a basketball hoop. Now... I'm not sure how much of this part of their story is true, but I was very convincingly told the following by one of them, and I'm just retelling you what I was told. There were two male counsellors and three female. They took the Ouija board out to the centre of the labyrinth and started to use it, you know, the typical young college kid bullshit, messing around. They began asking questions, and the planchette started moving around. After about ten minutes of this, the board started to spell people's names. Names that the counsellors were related to. But names the other counsellors wouldn't know. That's when it really started getting weird. It began making threats. Whatever it was, was threatening to hurt the people whose names were coming through the board. Then they asked its name, and it responded, not giving its name, but just the single letter, C. They asked it where it was, and where it was from. Now, in this barn, on the right-hand side, if you face the basketball hoop and look up into the left corner, it's a dark corner, the darkest part of the building. It then came through and said, in the dark part. That area being the only dark part, one of the males looked up, and there was this dark figure clinging to either side of the wall. It came through the board one more time and said, Hell. That is when they all picked up the board and ran the hell out of there. But here's the thing. In the following months... Each of those names that came through the board either passed away in car accidents, got cancer and passed, or got injured in some way. From what I was told, one of the women buried the board deep into the ground somewhere. She, nor the other two women, have since returned to the camp. The men have, and counselled again but one of them refuses to talk about the experience or enter the barn alone. Fast forward now to the summer of 2017. I've graduated from high school and I'm now counselling the junior camp. It's the second to last camp of the year and this group is from third graders to fifth graders. The week starts on a Sunday and ends on that coming Saturday. The counsellors typically arrive the day before the campers, so we get there the day the previous week of camp leave. I always love to arrive earlier than the arrival time in order to grab the bed I want and start setting up the room I'll be in. The arrival time for this week was four o'clock, so I got there around two. 
but the cleaning people must have locked the doors for some reason, so I decided to go to the top of the barn, lay on the couch, and play a few games on my phone, maybe take a nap to pass the time. This, by the way, was all before I was informed of what had happened just the year prior, so I had no reason to be afraid. But after about an hour or so, I started hearing these weird noises coming from the left of me, in the corner of the barn. Weird tapping noises from the top corner. Well, I ignored it, just thinking it was the natural sound an old barn would make. Given it was an old wooden barn and a metal roof, but the noises continued for about ten minutes or so. I started getting this weird feeling in my gut that something wasn't right, and so I decided to go and get up and sit on one of the picnic benches outside. I figured it wouldn't be long until another person would arrive. As I'm sitting there in complete silence, save for the occasional car ride here from the main road, and the birds chirping, it was just truly peaceful. I heard this loud bang from the barn. Admittedly, it did startle me given I was the only person in sight. But I put it down to maybe something had just fell. It was an old barn, so maybe something had just given way. So I went to investigate. And then I hear another bang. Now I know an animal or someone has to be in there. As I got closer to the barn, I heard a car coming up the gravel driveway. It was finally another counsellor arriving. After they pulled in, I noticed it was one of my former counsellors, so I was happy to see them. It also just happened to be one of the men from the Ouija tale. I informed him of the weird noises that were going on in the barn, and that is when he told me what they'd done the previous year, telling me never to go in there alone. Of course, I didn't believe him. Why should I? It's a church camp. Nothing like that could happen here, I thought. But I came to find out I was completely and utterly wrong. Fast forward to Wednesday of that week, and it was time to camp out in the pavilion that was at the top of the hill. There were around 30 campers this year, and everyone was up at the pavilion, along with all the councillors and the directors for that week. Once all the campers fell asleep, a fellow councillor, let's call him Joe for confidentiality, and I sneak off to get some late-night snacks from the bottom of the barn. As we were walking down... I told him of the events that happened the previous year, still not believing it, and we both started to joke around. At some point, whilst laughing and being somewhat close to the barn, I said something I would later regret. Screw a demon. What's it gonna do? Absolutely nothing. Joe laughed along with me, and we continued to go down to the barn. We got our snacks, walked around the camp for a while, and after about an hour of walking, we decided we should go back up to the pavilion to see if another counsellor, Amber, wanted to join us. We quietly entered the pavilion and walked up to her and suggested going to the top of the barn to just sit and eat some snacks. She said, yeah, and so we walked down the hill once more to the barn, this time to the top section. Once we walked in, we noticed it was colder than it usually was. But we shrugged it off, and we went and sat on the couch. After about another hour, Joe and I told Amber about the alleged Ouija tale, and she started to freak out. That's when I heard the same tapping I heard on that Saturday coming from that dark corner of the barn. Amber was really starting to get freaked out, but being the dumb, immature 18-year-old I was, 
I stood up, walked over to the corner and stared up. Nothing was there, just darkness. So I decided I was going to say something. Either do something or shut the hell up. Amber quietly yelled at me to stop, saying we really should go back up to the pavilion. It was 3.30am at this point, and we only had four more hours to sleep before we had to wake the kids up. So we did. Saturday came and all the campers were picked up and were gone. Now it was just me, Joe and Amber. Joe and Amber were staying for the next week, mini-camp as it was known. It was just a Sunday through Wednesday, with first and third graders. In truth, it was very little work, and so therefore, if the opportunity ever came up, I would have loved to do it. The director for that week asked if I could stay to help, as one of the male counsellors had cancelled at last minute. I said I'd ask my mum to see if it was OK. So I walked to the director's cabin, pulled out my phone and called my mum. The phone started to ring and then I heard my mum say hello from the other side. And then I heard nothing. Static started coming through from her end. I said, hello, mum, but nothing, just static. Then I hear a voice coming through the phone, almost whispering. I was weirded out by this because who whispers someone's name like that? I pause and say, hello, and then once again, I hear it through the static, but louder and more aggressive this time. As I go to hang up my phone, it restarts itself. I leave the room and walk back up to the front of the cabin and tell Joe and Amber what just happened, but they don't believe me and think I'm just trying to scare them. At that point, my phone finally turned back on, so I called my mother once again. She picked up and said, Hello, son, how was your week? I said, I'm sorry about before, I don't know what happened. She said, Sorry for what? How was your week? I said, Sorry for the call failing. Now, this is when I got freaked out. Sean... My mum said, I haven't talked to you since you left. What are you talking about? I said, um, nothing mum. Maybe I called the wrong person by accident. And I shrugged it off. I then asked if it was okay to stay on, and she said no. Well, I did have a job and other responsibilities to return to, so I ended up going home. But this is where the story gets really weird. You see, starting that night, I began having these weird dreams. Around the same time, every single night, for months. I would be sleeping in bed and wake to see a tall, black figure. When I say a black figure, I mean pitch black. Darker than any black I've seen in my life. Stood right in front of me, with dark red eyes. And it felt like it wasn't staring at me, but through me, into the deepest parts of my soul. Then I would wake up and look at the clock, and it was 3.30am. I didn't tell anyone about it, in fear of them saying I was making it up. It was now August, and I headed off to my freshman year of college to play football. I went to a small Division Three school in the middle of nowhere West Virginia, but as the weeks went on, I was still having this dream. But each time it grew longer and longer. It came to a point where the black figure started to talk. 
in a deep, raspy voice that would leave my ears ringing even when I woke up. All it would say was, One, one, five. And then scream this blood-curdling scream, and that's when I would wake up. Now, I would have to wonder what the hell 115 meant. I would research the number, looking at demonic symbols, looking up religious meanings, but I never came up with any good information. I researched this far more than my homework. Then, one night, I was having the same dream, this time earlier than I usually would. Same dream, but this time it said... One, one, five. It is time. And then it vanished. I woke up. The clock read 1.15 a.m. I said out loud, What the fuck? And then sat there for a few hours not being able to sleep. Confused as hell and admittedly scared to death. At some point, exhaustion took over and I fell asleep. Then I woke up to my phone ringing. It was my mum. I pick up and groggily say, Mum, is everything okay? She said, Sean, I need to tell you something. Listen to me. She then proceeded to tell me that one of my friends from high school died last night in a car accident. When the fire department and paramedics arrived on the scene, he was pronounced dead on arrival. This would have been approximately 1.15 a.m. My jaw dropped. I felt every single emotion in that moment, but I didn't know what to do. You would think this story ends here, but it doesn't. Halloween 2017 came just a few weeks later and my college was hosting a ghost hunt. I hadn't had any creepy dreams in a while and all seemed peaceful. So what's the worst that could happen? We went to the building and nothing happened. We then went to the president's house, which, during the Civil War, was used as a nursing home for soldiers. In the basement, there's a five-foot-wide, seven-feet-tall, small room with a big metal door that slides in place and then locks by a big latch from the outside. The host for the night asked if anyone was willing to go in there and be locked in with a thermal camera and an EVP device. You know the thing they use on ghost adventurers? Well, as you may guess, my crazy ass volunteered to do it. I walked in. The host set up one of the thermal cameras in a hole in the wall where a missing stone was, then handed me the EVP device. He said, good luck, then closed the door and latched it. Then he and the group went to the other side of the basement. I could still hear them faintly from the other side of the room, moving around and their muffled voices asking questions. About 20 minutes go by, and then I hear one of them say, OK, one last question. If anyone's down here, pull someone's hair. At this time, I had long hair. That's when I started to feel this burning sensation on my back. And the next thing... My hair is tugged backwards. I hit my head on the stone wall. At this point, I started pounding on the metal door to let me out. They all come rushing over and open the door, asking what's wrong. Visibly freaked out, I explain I have a burning sensation on my back and something had grabbed my hair and pulled it back. I then lift my shirt up and the whole room gasps. One of the girls snaps a picture on her phone and shows it to me. And there's three huge scratch marks 
running straight down my back. Well, that explains it, I say, trying not to act scared. The host then looked at the thermal camera and gasped. You could visibly see a hand. And not a normal hand. Oh, no. One with abnormally long fingers and long fingernails grabbing at my hair and yanking it. Wasting no time, the host, the dean and I drive down to the campus pastor's house. The dean called on the way down to explain what had happened and he prayed over me for what felt like an eternity. But after it was all done, I felt like there was this weight that was lifted off me. The school have never done another ghost hunt to date. But I knew it wasn't a ghost that would be haunting that school. I knew exactly who and what it was. Things were quiet for a while until fall semester 2019. My two roommates and I decided to move dorm buildings to freshen things up. We moved into room 235. We each had our own room and there was a spare, which was locked. One day, I came back from class and walked over to one of my roommate's room to find him and my other roommate. Alex gave me this look and Ian said, Bro, not to freak you out or anything, but we watched someone walk from the empty room into your room. I said, what? But that door's locked, and it's been locked since we arrived. I know, man, but they walked right through that door and into your room, Ian explained. We were all a little freaked out, to say the least. But thinking it might just be a peaceful spirit, I walked over to the seemingly empty room and said, Listen, I'm okay with you being here, as long as you're respectful to me and my space when I'm here. You can come in and out when I'm not, if you want. Talking like I was talking to one of my roommates. We would all be sitting in the lounge area watching TV and we would hear things moving around in the locked, empty bedroom. None of us had the key. But it sounded like the desk or bed would be moving around, the window opening and closing. We lived on the top floor, so we knew nobody could have gotten in through the window. Eventually, we all just got used to it and tried to make things a little less weird and creepy we decided to give it a name. Ian suggested Clarence, because we thought it was funny and sounded non-threatening. Little things would occur, such as a cup would go missing, and we'd find it in a random place, like in the bathroom or under one of our beds. But nothing too crazy. Flash forward to around October. I was starting to date my now fiancé and she is deathly afraid of all things paranormal. We were laying there in bed one evening, and she started getting this weird feeling like someone was there with us. The air became thick, and, being asthmatic, I was low-key starting to struggle to breathe. She turned to me and said, Sean, something's in here. I'm telling you, worried and afraid. I responded saying, Listen, there's nothing here. You're okay. Everything is out. Before I could finish, our blanket was yanked from our bed and flew across the room. She jolted up and sprinted out of that room and into Ian's room, frantically crying and freaking out. I slowly stood up looked around the room and sighed. I go over and check on her and explain to my roommates in a calm manner what happened. 
From then on, we would only sleep at her place, as she would refuse to go to my room, even in a dorm with three guys. A couple of days go by from that experience, and those awful dreams begin again. However, one thing is different. It was all the same, the tall figure, the red eyes, but the time changed. Now, it would say... Four, four, five. And I'd wake up with the ringing in my ears in a cold sweat. Something about this dream felt different. I scanned the room because something just didn't seem right. Everything seemed in place, but the last thing I looked at, which I would typically look at first, was the TV. It was a show or a movie I've never seen before. But on the screen, as I looked at it, it was paused on an alarm clock. And that alarm clock read 4.45. I immediately turned off the TV and lay awake in the darkness until the next day. This dream recurred for over a year until September the 18th, 2020. The pandemic shut down the entire world that year, and needless to say, it was a rough one. Not only because we weren't allowed to do much or go anywhere, but the bangs, objects moving, doors and windows being open and shut at all hours of the night followed me wherever I was, whether it was my house or my girlfriend's house. But that year... On that date, college was back in session and my girlfriend and I were in my room in the frat house, the one I'd moved into that semester. We were smoking weed and the next thing I knew, I got this terrible deafening ringing in my ear, the exact one I would get when I'd come out of these nightmares, which were still occurring. But this time, I was awake. It just came out of nowhere, accompanied by one of the worst migraines I'd ever experienced. We decided to take a nap to see if it would make a difference. I felt like I was asleep for about ten minutes when the nightmare occurred for the millionth time. But this time, something just felt different. Then he screamed and I woke up, the ringing still in my ears, but my phone was also ringing. And again, it was my mum. She called to give me news of something I wasn't expecting to hear until I was at least in my thirties. Sean? She took a long pause. Yes, mum, I said. What's up? Are you, are you sitting down right now? Her voice sounded cracked, like she'd been crying. A million thoughts went through my head all at once. Mum, what's going on? You're scaring me now. My girlfriend saw the look of worry on my face and started rubbing my back. My mum then told me something that completely broke me. Sean, your nan collapsed at the house. She's been taken to the hospital and she's been transferred to another hospital in Pittsburgh, but it's not looking good. As soon as I heard those words come out of my mum's mouth, I collapsed from my bed to the ground in tears. And I screamed the loudest scream I ever have in my life. My grandmother, my best friend in the entire world. The one person in my life I could run to for anything, from anyone. 
just for an ear to talk. My everything in this world. The doctors said she had a decent chance, though there were no guarantees. I drove home the same day I got the phone call, and I immediately went to my grandparents' house. I unlocked the door and went in, sat on the couch and broke down. After a while of just sobbing, I begin to hear this thumping sound coming from their bedroom upstairs. I got up, at this point in a rage, and stormed upstairs to the master bedroom, all the while still hearing these thumps. Once I opened the door, the thumping was gone. Dead silence. And when I say dead silence, I mean dead. Not a sound could be heard. No cars from outside. No creaking house noises. No thumps. It was almost as if I had left reality. And I was in a different place. I scanned the room, looked into the closet and under the bed... Nothing, no one, only me in there. Suddenly, I felt a coldness wash over me. Colder than anything I've felt before. The house has no air conditioning and the fan was off. It was 70 degrees outside, so there was no reason for this cold. The next thing I knew... Someone whispered in my ear, Sean. in the same aggressive tone I hadn't heard in years. I got dizzy and fell back onto the bed, ringing in my ears, getting louder and louder. And the next thing I know, I'm being awoken by my mum. I've tried calling you for hours. I thought something happened. Still groggy. And not acknowledging my mum, I looked at the alarm clock to check the time. 2 a.m. I arrived here around quarter to seven. Hello, did you hear me? My mum said, worried. Yeah, yeah, mum, I, I hear you. I'm sorry, I must have passed out and my phone died. Uh, wait a minute, why are you here at this time of night? The next thing I knew, she stood up, turned around without saying a word. Mom, hello, are you going to answer my question? The room began to get cold, freezing even. And before I could say another word, my mother started to laugh. No. Something inside my mother started to laugh. It wasn't her laugh. It was a deep laugh, mixed with her own. She seemed to be getting taller by the second, as tall as seven feet. Her limbs began to elongate, making a snapping sound as they got bigger. I was in total shock. Unable to move or say anything, I squeezed my eyes shut like in a horror film, hoping when I opened them she'd be gone. But when I opened my eyes, it was him. Laughing and saying, Four, four, five, it is time. But this time he didn't scream. I was finally able to muster a sense of a voice, and I said, Fuck you, you... But before I could finish, it swung its large, sharp fingers at me, scratching my chest. I quickly glanced at the alarm. 4.45am. I lift my shirt, and there's three long scratch marks running diagonally across my chest. I scramble to find my phone, but before I can find it, my granddad walks in the room. I immediately run and hug him. I hadn't hugged him in years. I looked at him and I said, 
crying. She's gone, Pop-Pop. She's gone. I just knew. He dropped to his knees, and for the first time in my life, I saw my grandfather cry. After half an hour, I called my mum, and I told her to call the hospital. She did, and they confirmed. I was right. I don't know what this thing wants from me, or why he's coming for me and the people I love. Maybe it's because I mocked it, thinking it couldn't hurt me. I've done a lot of research, but I can't seem to find anything. I may be looking in the wrong places, I'm not sure. It's now June the 30th, 2023, as I write this. And it has been quiet since that day. And I pray that it doesn't return. Because when it does, I don't know who it's taking next. It scares the hell out of me to even fathom it. But this is where I leave it. For now, anyway, because I know it will be back one day. And when he does return, I'll get back in touch. Regards, Sean. Well, Sean, thank you so much for sending in your true paranormal experience for episode 3 of season 13. And as a genuine shout-out for help for Sean, if anyone has any advice, get in touch via contact at thedarkparanormal.com. Now, before we say thank you to our wonderful Patreons, don't forget, if true crime is also your thing, today we've launched The Deadly Countdown. And it's no standard launch. We've launched with three debut episodes, so you can have a little binge of how the show's going to be. So, go and search The Deadly Countdown. But right now, we need to thank our newest wonderful team members over at Patreon. And they are... Eric Hoff, Kimmy, Diana Gillian, Bailey Rolfing, Sabina Kalani, Michelle Bell, T. O'Neill, John Termine, Ola Foxy 1999, Natasha W., Helen Gallagher, Casey Custard, Alyssa Token, Kirsty Torvenen, Marissa D., Morgan, Dady Shazer, Alana Valley, Holly, Johnny McDonough, Shell Bell, Victoria Velardi, Siobhan Lawrence, Lash Owenbush, Armani Achillea, Kevin Aronia, Brittany L, Christian, General Sniff, Amanda McIntyre Plough, Amanda Mendez, M. Chappell, Jenna Steen, Jason Murray, Ofu Vey, Cindy Vedder, Zorigail Bellino, Ingebjor Conrad's Dottier, Antoine Miller, Rebecca Graham, Dawn Stevens, Michael Eldridge, Letitia Larrison, Lachlan Crawford, Timmy Peter Smith, Melissa Wilson, Aisha Moyodin, Jessica Maroney, and Karen C. Thank you so much, guys. Your support truly means the world. And I hope you enjoy all the additional ad-free content and, of course, those Dark Bites episodes. And if you'd like to join our team over at Patreon, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. Plus, if you're waiting for your name to be said, do not worry. We are working our way through everybody's name who's signed up so your name will be read out over the upcoming shows. Speaking of upcoming shows, next week we have one bizarre experience to share with you. And believe me, you may need to sit down after hearing this one. But until next week, thank you for choosing to spend your time with me here on your show. And before we go, I'd just like to add that Sean has sent over one last request. And that is to reiterate that now the camp is completely ghost-free and no longer deemed haunted. So anyone debating sending their children there can rest assured. But whenever you're discussing the paranormal, always try and leave some of your disbelief at the door. And I'll see you next week, right here on The Dark Paranormal.